Remember how I said last Avian Jay's Adventures to Alaska was the most ambitious one yet? Well, I think it's about time we top that, because I am going to Malaysia in Southeast Asia in the middle of monsoon season to catch rare fish with someone who works with wild fishes there and is frequently finding brand new observations on iNaturalist. That's right, I'm going to be spending two weeks, I don't know why I held up one finger, two weeks in Malaysia catching rare fish and seeing what we can come across. This is the most ambitious and most hype Avian Jays adventure so far. The flight there is a total of about 26 hours. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to prep for and a lot that I'm worried about, but I'm also very excited for this experience. Let's do it. And with that, I had arrived in Malaysia. I was here to meet a man named Azam, who is a PhD student at a Malaysian university. He was studying peat swamp fishes, which are fishes in these really extreme still water environments with low oxygen and high acidity. So after a first day of letting him get some work done at the university, we went home, got a good night's sleep, and headed out for field work the next day. This involved driving sometimes multiple hours into forest, into plantation, or into jungle to find these stillwater peat swamp environments that are just nestled in between these normal freshwater fast flowing streams. And there we would find the fishes in the extremes. These are cherry barbs. They're common in the aquarium trade, and in the aquarium trade they can survive a variety of environments. But in the wild, you find find them in these crazy extreme low oxygen peat swamps. This is a type of rasbora. I love this fish. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Those big scales, that black line. Azam didn't understand why I found it pretty, but man, I loved it. This is a type of Desmopuntius johorensis, a zebra barb. And we found a lot of these, and really during their different life stages, they look completely different. This is an adult. The lines are going the complete opposite way. This is a type of walking catfish. They're actually invasive in Florida in the United States because they can literally walk on land. So if one invades a pond, it can get to a river, to a lake, to a stream from walking across the land. This is a coolie loach. They're very common in the aquarium trade. Everybody loves these little guys. But in the wild, you can find them in these highly extreme oxygen-deprived environments. This is another Johorensis. You can see how, how different they look at different stages of their life, how confusing that would be to be a fish biologist 100 years ago that didn't have proper DNA to work with. This is a type of snakehead, not the invasive one that we have in the United States, but a dwarf snakehead, very cute and native to the environment. At first, when I started sampling, I was really nervous. We had to get really dirty and muddy to do this sampling. We had to get in the water, and I was nervous about it. But as you can see, by the end of the first day, I was ready to get down and dirty swimming in the water. And every day, we would go home and record the specimens and data and wait out the monsoon. Yes, this would literally happen every single night. It would rain like this. It was absurd. The next day, we headed right back into the jungle, doing some difficult work to try and catch some of these rare and interesting fishes, like this, which is the smallest fish species in the world. These are full-grown adults. This has a sucker on its belly to suck onto things. This is called a Wallagonia. These catfish actually get pretty big, but we managed to catch one that was on the littler side. This is a type of pipefish. In America, the pipefish are all saltwater, but Malaysia has multiple species of freshwater pipefish. This is just a beautiful catfish with a lovely face. I love how funny their faces are. And another beautiful catfish called Ompok. This one literally looks like a radish. I love the coloration. I am deep in the Malaysian jungle right now. <laughs> Just hear the sounds of frogs and birds. There are tons of mosquitoes, which is why I'm wearing this. Um, but we caught all sorts of beautiful and amazing fish out here. I am very happy with. And I found tons of weird bugs and uh, other related things. So the, hopefully I'll be able to find something rare. There's a lot of butterflies I've been noticing. I've been taking pictures of butterflies. Uh, they're very, very pretty, and I know Southeast Asia has a lot of endemic butterflies, so maybe I'll find one of those. But in the meantime, I'm basically hanging out on one side is Big Swamp, and on the other side 
is small swamp stream and we just finished our work for the day surveying that and uh, got a few interesting things like a spiny eel pretty cool now we have to head to the next site and uh, keep going it's a lot of work day my Malaysian friends were gonna be busy so I took an uber out to a city canal to do some fishing of my own in an environment I'm more used to there are absolutely millions of these tiny tiny fish millions Let's see what they are ah duppies these are wild guppies. They are invasive here, they're not native here, but these are just the same guppies you would get in your aquarium, living here in the wild. Holy shit, those are all fish. How are there no predators here? That black is literally just fish. This is just a giant pool of fit. Oh, there's bigger ones in there. All right, we got some catching to do. Yeah, man. If anyone's uh, in need of some guppies, holy crap, there are so many. I just scooped through this little area. There's other stuff in there too. I'll have to get pictures of. Oh, would you look at this guy? <laughs> That's a whole ass meal right there of invasive fish. My God. Very pretty though. <laughs> the next day we headed deep into the jungle to find some rare betta fish called betta Persephone and betta Cochina. These are betta fish that would sell for probably hundreds of dollars in an aquarium trade. So they're in very difficult to find locations. In fact, we had to take this float boat thing that Kim had set up at some past date. So to get across this little lake, we had a rope tied to either side and we had to get on essentially two barrels on wood and pull ourselves across using that rope. It was literally like something out of an exploration movie because there was no other real path to get across to the pond. There had been no trail made. Uh, so yeah, that's how we got ourselves across. And this was the reward. These are Betta Cocina, the red wine Betta. They are very pretty, even in this mucky, dirty water. You can tell that they're very pretty and interesting fish. Uh, so it was definitely a cool thing to be able to witness personally. Uh, then we headed out to some more brackish water where we saw these bumblebee gobies, these absolute goobers. Uh, and then I would get to meet Betta Pugnox, the Penang Betta. Uh, very pretty individual here, a female with the blue spots and the blue on her face. This is another Betta Pugnox, and this is likely an undescribed species of Rasbora. Uh, my guide, Kim, was not totally sure about it. And uh, yeah, we were exploring this beautiful forest area. Kim was a wonderful guide. There was just one downside. Yeah, Kim snores really loudly, but uh, that's okay. You get used to it over time. 
and we would head out to different locations, probably five to six locations every day trying to find as many species as possible. This location it had just rained the night before, so it should be murky by all means, which should show you how crystal clear it is on a normal day, the fact that it was still pretty clear on this day. Uh, I even managed to spot some of these Barbados cellifer, and I was even able to spot one of these spiny eels just chilling in the sand in the water, and I could get pretty close with my phone and zoom in. Uh, we even found these tetras that are very common in the aquarium trade, but apparently are becoming less and less common in the wild. And this Barbados dunkery, which Kim thinks is one of the most beautiful fish in Malaysia. I don't know, maybe I'm just not a fan of the coloration. Then we headed out to this area to use the cast net. If you've never seen a cast net before, this is what it looks like. It essentially drops a huge ring into the water to get the fish, and, you know, surrounds them. I don't believe it's magnetized, but you pull it up and the rocks go with it and they get trapped in the net. I have never used a cast net before, but after going to Malaysia, I think I'm going to start using cast nets. Uh, they seem better than I realized. For these open waters, we're using, you know, dip nets or hand nets uh, is a bit too difficult to actually pull off. The cast nets are wonderful and go pretty deep. And look at this, we were ev even able to catch a big humpala barb. And we were able to give this to a local and feed them and then go to rest for the night to prepare for the next day. The next day was absolutely crazy with the stuff that we found. So I'll let the music take it away. And with that, it was time for my final day in Malaysia. We started off by meeting some of these elephants. They're wild elephants that are being trained not to be aggressive towards humans so that there are less accidents happening on roads where wild elephants are interacting with people. And then we headed out to these locations where we'd find these beautiful fish, such as this Apollo shark, which although not a shark, I think has that sort of aggressive look like a barracuda. This is the Penang River. It's absolutely huge and it's murky and muddy and how we managed to catch anything interesting here I have no idea, but we did. Uh, this is a very beautiful catfish and this is a pipefish, a different species of pipefish from the one I showed earlier. I believe this is a gravid female. She looks like uh, she's a little too fat to be a regular female. I think she probably has eggs stowed in her. Uh, and this is basically the method that we would use to catch all of the fish. This is a seine net. One person holds it on each end and they drag it through uh, weeds or some area that we've like baited. We've thrown some fish food in the water to bait the fish to get there. You drag it through the weeds best you can while keeping the bottom side of it on the bottom and the top side of it on the top so the fish have no place to escape bring it together and you find great stuff like this, a fish which had not been seen in the wild since 1967. Then we headed to this fast flowing area, which might have been my favorite part of the entire trip because look at how beautiful this fish is. But it's not even the most beautiful fish that I caught at this fast flowing part. Look at this tire track eel absolutely gorgeous. These locations were beautiful, Malaysia was beautiful, and I mean, I loved every second of it. It's a wonderful country, and well, it was time to go home.
So Zach, how many pieces we catch? 135. In one week, right? Yeah, yeah. About yeah. One week. So yeah. Please come again and then we try in northern Malaysia. Okay. And also Borneo. Also Borneo. Okay, see you again.